It's time for the Rose Chat Podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating the world's most beloved flower, the rose. Join award-winning gardeners Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington as they chat with rose lovers and experts from around the globe. With each episode, you'll gain valuable knowledge and insights to achieve the rose garden you've always dreamed of. Listen now as we explore the world of roses. Try Haven Brand Soil Conditioners providing generations of gardeners with a truly all-natural alternative to chemical fertilizers with their line of composted manure and alfalfa teas. Easy to brew and use on all indoor and outdoor plants. Find them online at manuretea.com. Hey friends, today we're talking about subjects that are just perfect for this time of year as we make decisions on what to plant in the garden. We'll be looking at some wonderful roses, and some companion plants for roses. Natalie Carmoli is here to tell us about some beautiful proven winners and color choice options. Hey, Natalie, welcome to Rose Chat. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk about roses with you today. Oh, just perfect timing. Now, Natalie, you and I were together at a rose conference recently where I was able to see firsthand some of the new roses our listeners are going to love hearing about. But before we start talking about plants, could you give our listeners a bit of the background about where and how these roses are grown and tested? I sure can. So uh, I work as a marketing and public relations specialist for uh, an independent nursery called Spring Meadow Nursery. And we're located in Grand Haven, Michigan. So that's on the west side of Michigan, uh, really close to the shore of Lake Michigan. So we, we garden in about a zone 6B. And uh, the nursery I work for, Spring Meadow Nursery, is the exclusive licensee to grow Proven Winners Color Choice shrubs. So anytime you see a Proven Winners Color Choice shrub in a garden center in Alabama, in California, even in Canada, it started at Spring Meadow Nursery. So we call those little shrubs that we grow liners meaning they are uh, small little plants. Generally, they go from a two and a quarter inch plug to a quick turn plant, which is about the size of a quart size container. And um, we grow those exclusively to sell to other growers that we call finished growers. And they grow them to the larger sizes and sell them to wholesalers, nurseries, and garden centers. So we sell millions and millions of these little plants we call liners, Uh, We exclusively grow woody ornamentals, uh, meaning shrubs, basically, plants Mm -hmm. that grow on a woody framework. And uh, we don't grow from from seed. We don't grow from graft. So none of the roses we're going to talk about today are grafted onto a different root. They're all own root roses. And uh, they're all grown from cuttings that we take here in either our, um, some are in greenhouses, but most of them are out in our growing fields. We call those our mother plants. So we take these cuttings from our mother plants and we root them and grow them as liners in our greenhouses. So you're not just growing one or two. Oh, no, we're growing millions and millions (laughs) of plants a year. (laughs) So, yeah, and it takes a lot of, I mean, to supply North America with Proven Winners Color Choice shrubs, it takes a lot of plants and uh, it takes a long time to grow a shrub. And we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in detail because it's not just growing the shrub from this little liner, it's also the trialing and testing that goes into that before that shrub even reaches uh, the liner stage. Uh, So I'll talk a little about that. Um, I'm trying trying to decide what I can talk about uh, audio wise. Uh, (laughs) I have these great pictures and I wish people could see them. We actually have these videos online of our greenhouses and a lot of the automation that we have at our greenhouses because we don't, you know, in order to grow millions and millions of plants, it, it would take a lot of people to make that happen. But we have a lot of automation that helps us with that. Um, we have automation, you know, machines that stick these little liners into containers, like with a mechanical arm that sticks them into the 
into the plug containers. We have uh, a machine that sorts plugs into different sizes. So the same size plants are growing together. And we have extensive, you know, watering systems. Some plants are watered overhead, but other plants like roses, they don't like to be watered overhead. It really damages their foliage. They don't like to sit there with wet foliage, right? That's how we get Mm -hmm. black spot and powdery mildew. So we have flood floors in a lot of our greenhouses where uh, they can sit, you know, all these plants, we call them liners because they're in trays lined up on the floor of the (laughs) greenhouses. They're not grown on benches. All of our liners are just sitting on the floor and these flood floors will flood certain areas. It's computerized. So we can say, well, we want this section of the greenhouse to be flooded at this time. They'll flood up that section. The water's held in by rubber bumpers. The plants then can sit and soak up the water from underneath. It gives them really, really strong roots that way. Mm -hmm. And then when they're done soaking up the required amount of water, that water goes back through the holes in the flood floors, and it's cleaned and treated and used in other parts of the greenhouse. Such a big operation. I love love hearing about that. And I've seen some of the videos, and it is very Mm -hmm. fascinating. Um, Could you share with our listeners a bit about how you test them now that you've grown them? Sure. Uh, So any of the plants we were just talking about, all these liners, all these millions and millions of liners that you see that, that come out of our greenhouse, never make it into those growing greenhouses without going through our trialing uh, with our going through some extensive trials. So let's talk about roses in particular. Now we trial every plant we sell, right? But roses uh, and any plant are going to go through five to 10 years of trialing mm. before they make it into, you know, before they're chosen to be part of the proven winners catalog. Now for roses, we work with multiple breeders across the country. So we work with um, breeders out of Wisconsin. We work with breeders from the South. We work from breeders in Europe and uh, they submit their roses to us. And then we put them through some, some pretty brutal trialing. Actually, um, they aren't really treated to these flood floors I just talked about. They don't sit there keeping nice dry foliage with lots of air circulation around them. They're crammed into a trialing greenhouse. Tight, each each container tight up next to the next container. They're watered overhead. They're kept Mm -hmm. in that same container for a couple of years, so they're crowded. We don't treat them with any fungicides. And then... Um, we start sorting through them. And the ones that are really stressed out that don't make the cut, that get black spot or powdery mildew, or they just stop flowering or they defoliate, those all get thrown away. But there are always some cultivars that are like, I don't care. I could take this. I am a winner. I, I am mm-hmm. I am going to be a proven winner rose. And then we take those that can survive these really really stressful conditions, and we take them to the next part of our testing, which is uh, in-ground trial gardens. And we have a couple of ways that we do that. Uh, We have the trial fields, which is just what it sounds like. It's just a big field of shrubs, shrubs planted in rows. They get, once again, overhead boom watering, you know, at certain amounts of time, but they sit out there baking in the sun and they really don't get any special treatment at all. They just sit out in the fields and we see how they're going to perform in that situation. Once again, the ones that do great, we keep. The ones that don't, out the door. Um, And then we also trial them in a garden situation because a lot of people will say, well, sure, if a rose does okay in a greenhouse and in your trial gardens, but that's not the same as my home garden. So we put them in a home garden situation. We have uh, these really beautiful display gardens at uh, our greenhouse owner's home. He has over 20 acres of display gardens. And within that is a really extensive rose trial uh, bed. It's like a circle of roses. And some of them are roses we already have in our catalog. Some are ones we are looking at in the future. And those are really treated in the in the same way that you would have them in your own garden. 
um, in an optimal garden. They're watered mm-hmm. from underneath. They have, you know, the watering soaks them from underneath. They get regular pruning or trimming if they need it. And we see how they perform in that situation. It's also a really great way for us to plant them next to another rose that maybe isn't a dark, innocent in our catalog and say, how does it perform next to that one? Is it flowering from top to bottom as nicely as that one does? Does it have as many flowers? Is mm-hmm. is the foliage staying more healthy? That's all really important to us because we want to make sure when somebody buys a proven winner's color choice rose, it's going to perform for them in their garden the same way it performed in all of our trials. So it's kind of a, an extensive process, but we feel like that's really, really important. Well, it's really important to me because I can buy in confidence because I don't grow roses in rows. I'm a cottage gardener, and any rose that I bring to my garden is going to have neighbors. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> they do not get to be divas in my garden, especially a garden right. that's you know, 35 years old. It's just packed with things I love. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> I keep bringing things in, and it's hard to let things go. It is. I do the same. <laughs> so we appreciate your hard work and attention to detail. So tell us about some of the newer roses that we'll be seeing for sale this year. So it's, I've got a little, I've got a few that you're going to find. It, it's, a, it's a conundrum really, because there, we want to always, always encourage people to shop at their local garden center first, right? Yes. So some of the new roses I'm going to talk about that I just can't help but talk about aren't going to be available in your garden center this year. You will be able to find them online at provenwinners.com. But I want to tell you about them anyway, and this is why. If you want to see a new plant at your garden center, it's important that you let the people at your garden center know that because Mm -hmm. carrying a new plant is a risky business. They want to, you know, they only have so much bed space and they want to make sure if they're bringing in something that isn't a tried and true that they know sells every year, that people are going to want to buy it, that it's going to, you know, pay for that space it's occupying on their benches. So when you go to your garden center and you say, you know, I saw this beautiful new Ringo Rose from, from, Proven Winners Color Choice, and, you know, I'd really like to buy it here, they can then go to their wholesaler and say, I've got customers asking for this rose. I think it's a good, you know, I think this is going to be a risk that pays off. I can can also speak to that just a little bit. In my um, area, I know my garden center people, and they know me, and uh, you can develop relationships with them. If you have information, they do want to know it. They do... Um, they do like that collective information and in making those decisions. You're so right, Natalie. And now, you know, the garden centers will ask me questions, you know, of things that I might hear or see. So it is very important, you know, make it a personal, uh, a personal relationship with those that are providing our plants. Right, right. Uh, like I always, I, I always like to say, um, people vote with their wallets. Right. So garden centers know what to carry because people vote for their, with their wallets. It's not, it's not, you know, you know, I would really love to see this, but if it doesn't sell, they can't carry it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's having that conversation, like you said, with your local garden center is so, so important, but let's talk about some new plants that I can, you know, that that, uh, you can look forward to to hopefully seeing in a garden center and um, you can find online if you're really, really eager to get them right away. Okay. So the first, uh, we have a couple new series of roses that I'd love to talk about. And the first series actually has some roses you'll find in your garden center and some that are coming to your garden center. And it's called Ringo series. And the reason it's called Ringo is it's that beautiful rose with that deep red eye. It's a Halthemia blend blend or hybrid rose. And uh, they always have, you know, the the petals will be a different color, but they'll always have that beautiful deep red eye. And we have three members of the Ringo series of rose right now. They're all, they're all hybridized by Chris Warner out of the UK. And we work with him a lot. He really, really breeds some beautiful disease resistant roses for us. And the first member of this series is called Ringo. 
the Ringo series. So clearly this was the first guy that we brought into the series. Um, it is a, a single rose. When it's really open, it looks like it could be a double rose, but it's got that wide open center. Pollinators love it. And uh, the interesting thing about Ringo Rose is each bloom starts out a bright yellow with a with a red eye and then it it starts to transition as the rose ages to a light yellow or it starts out a dark yellow bloom excuse me transitions to a lighter yellow bloom and then finally just before the rose is about to self-clean it turns white with a pink eye so the effect as this rose is blooming is three colors of roses at once on the same plant it's a beautiful, healthy rose, USDA zone four to eight, and it gets about to three to four feet tall and wide. Ringo got a lot of attention at Open Garden at my house, um, in my garden last June. People just kept stopping by and going, now what's this one? Uh, tell me about this one. I mean, it just really got people's attention. Yeah, it's a very floriferous plant. And that's why it was a no-brainer to bring in last year. And this, So you'll find Ringo at your garden center, hopefully. And then you'll also find brand new this year, or brand new last year, Ringo All-Star. So it's another member of this Ringo series, also bred by Chris Warner. And it's got melon orange blooms with that dark red center that kind of transition to a pinky purpley color so it's got that soft kind of sunset orange hue really beautiful with those bright yellow stamens in the center once again this is a single bloom rose and this one's a little bit smaller than Ringo two to three feet tall and also very very hard at USDA zone four to eight and then finally in the Ringo series we have our brand new uh, edition. And this will be available in 2023 at garden centers. And it's called Ringo Double Pink Rose. This also has bicolor blooms, like the name suggests, pink blooms, but they are a double bloom. So it's a little more full bloom. And it's got that deep, deep red, like almost a magenta eye in the center of it. Mm. Um, two to three feet tall and wide, a really, really beautiful double uh, bloom in this Ringo series. Very pretty, very pretty. Yeah. Um, this is uh, also a rose. I'm just starting to put it in rose trials now. And to speak about trials just a little bit, uh, it is my job at Spring Meadow Nursery to enter our Proven Winners Color Choice roses into rose trials. Anytime we enter a shrub rose into rose trials, we always enter them in the no spray category because we want to get, once again, make sure that anybody that puts them in their garden is going to have success with them. And those trials are so important to us because it's not, you know, it's one thing to trial them here in Michigan where we live, but putting them in these trials like the arts trials and the um, American Rose Society Award of Excellence and, and the um, American Rose Center trials, it allows us to trial these roses in all all climates in all areas of the United States. So we know how they perform in other areas as well. So Ringo Double Pink is going into trial soon. It's new to us. Uh, it's a winner of a first class certificate in the Hay Grows trial. So it's already won some awards overseas, as has Ringo. Uh, so we're really excited about what this might do here in the United States uh, now that we're able to release it. Okay, moving on. We have a series called Rise Up. And the reason it's called Rise Up is because it's a climbing rose series. Now, technically, we call them a mini climber. And the reason is these roses are full enough that they can be pruned and you can just grow them as a shrub rose, if you like, or they can be trained as a climber. How tall are they going to get? Well, each one has a different uh, height. So we, if we start out uh, with uh, Rise Up Ringo, that's going to get three to five feet tall and two to three feet wide. And then I'll talk about each one individually, but our okay. tallest is Rise Up Lilac Days. And that's going to get up to eight feet tall if it's trained as a climber. So they're different sizes. Um, so let me back up to Rise Up Ringo. Remember, we just talked about Ringo Roses, and this is Another Chris Warner rose. It is. It does have that red eye that we like, that Halthemia, um, 
uh, blend in that rose. But this is a really, really full yellow rose. So if you liked Ringo, but you're not really crazy about a single rose, this has that really full, roughly rosebud look. So you could see that red eye and they're kind of buried in all of these beautiful, roughly yellow flowers. But unlike Ringo, this is also a climber or a mini climber, as we call them. Uh, still hardy in USDA zone four to eight. It'll get three to five feet tall and two to three feet wide. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful yellow, bright yellow rose. Uh, this is one, the uh, Warsaw Rose Trials Photographers Award and the Australian National mm. Bronze Medal. So okay. it's done very well overseas. And a lot of times we see these, they're award-winning when we even get them, especially when they come from Chris Warner. They've already been entered in, you know, a lot of trials and, and a lot of award situations overseas. So it's nice to know that they've performed well overseas before mm -hmm. we even see them here. And the second rose in our Rise Up series is just this beautiful kind of a peach melon color rose called Rise Up Amberness. Mm -hmm. Also a Chris Warner. No, these are all Chris Warner roses in this series. Uh, it's very, very fragrant too. So all of these, now all these new roses I'm going to tell you about uh, from the Rise Up series on are all fragrant roses. Something we don't find in a lot of our shrub roses. We only have one fragrant shrub rose and that's At Last. We were really excited to introduce that. I think it was in 20. 19 or 2018, um, because it was a, sh a fragrant shrub rose. But uh, and we just didn't have that. That's not what shrub roses are bred to. It's just not something that's generally bred into shrub roses. They're bred for performance, and, the, and there's not a lot of scent. So we're really excited to have these new uh, series of roses that are bringing fragrance back into the collection, something that's so important with roses. I mean, anytime someone sees a beautiful rose, what's the first thing they do? Yes, yes. <laughs> We all know it's the nose to the rose. Mm -hmm. It's so exciting to hear the word fragrance and shrub in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. It is. So we have this Rise Up Amberness. Uh, in some ways, I suppose, it, it, it is similar to At Last, which I just talked about. But it, it tends more toward the yellow. At Last is a very, very apricot colored bloom. And this tends a little more to the yellow, very full thick sculpted petals on this rose. Uh, so it's a nice full rosebud. Um, it's going to get three to five feet tall and two to three feet wide, hardy in four through eight. So super hardy, like all of our roses, we may, you know, we don't put them in the series unless we know they're going to be resistant to black spot and powdery mildew. Now I want to make it clear when I say resistant, I don't mean that they're black spot and powdery mildew proof. No roses, yeah. you know, just like no roses, Japanese beetle proof. It's also not black spot and powdery mildew proof, um, but it's resistant. So, uh, you know, if you have a rose and you're, and there's nothing you can do, your sprinklers go off, you know, and it, they're overhead sprinklers, it's okay. Just sprinkle them in the morning so that the rose has time to dry off. You know, the foliage doesn't like to be wet. So just sprinkle it in the morning. If you, can, if you don't have, uh, uh, you know, the soaker hoses, it will resist the typical maladies that, that mm -hmm. rose foliage often mm -hmm. succumbs to. Yeah. So this was Rise Up uh, Amberness, beautiful amber-colored climbing rose. And then finally, we have Rise Up Lilac Days. This is the most fragrant of the three. It will just knock your socks off with scent. It also gets very tall, five to eight feet tall, two to four feet wide. So it really makes a beautiful statement uh, with these purpley blue colored flowers, a beautiful color uh, in the rose garden, I think, and a little more unusual. So, and they fade to a very light lavender color as they um, transition through their, their growing cycle. And Rise Up Lilac Days has uh, a lot of blooms at the end of each stem. So you're going to see, you know, just a really broad inflorescence of flowers on this uh, rose bush. They're held, you know, with roses that are held high above the foliage. So you're not going to get roses that are buried deep down into the foliage. It's just a beautiful scented 
climbing rose. And I really think, you know, this is a great one. I mean, you can you can prune it to be a shrub if you don't have a space for a climbing rose. But this one would just be, I think, make a beautiful statement as a, as a climber. Oh, that one's so going on my list. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, and the, same, the lavender yeah. color to me just, mm. you know, yeah, is, it's is so wonderful. Yes. Another interesting thing about Rise Up Lilac Days that I didn't realize until I was talking with one of our growers is, um, well, it's not thornless, it's relatively thornless. So mm-hmm. if you look at the new growth on it, you're not going to see a lot of prickles. Uh, so that's an interesting thing about it. I have noticed on the other side of underside of the leaves, they're a little more prickly, but uh, it's, you know, a lot of shrub roses are really, really heavy on the prickles and, and this is not so much. Wonderful. Yeah. So the last new series of roses that I want to talk about, I'm so excited about, and they're called Reminiscent. And uh, I I like the name Reminiscent because uh, it brings that word scent into the series name, which is very important and a very big part of the series. And uh, they're also reminiscent of, you know, a garden favorite, the glorious and gorgeous David Austin roses. They have that full uh, classic rose look. Uh, and, and that's an exciting, exciting thing to be able to bring to our uh, catalog with this reminiscent series. When I glance oh. at the catalog, I mean, you truly do. At first look, you think Old Garden Rose, David Austin Rose, mm-hmm. for sure, right off the bat. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is, they're just very, very beautiful in form. Mm-hmm. And they just, yeah. And you know, we, I brought a sample of that to a, a couple of events that you and I have both been to and uh, this reminiscent crema, which I'll talk about in detail in a minute. And the roses are, are so big and full. Sometimes the stem is just like, I can hardly hold it up. It's mm-hmm. such a beautiful, full mm-hmm. rose. Yeah. Um, you know, and the, the, it just makes them so beautiful for cuts even, you know, you mm-hmm. can cut them and bring them inside. It's, it's just gorgeous. And these reminiscent roses uh, are, are brought to us by a new breeding team that we hadn't worked with in the past. And they're called Fino Gino. And it's an all female breeding team uh, out of Serbia. They do their, their breeding and their trialing and their growing in greenhouses in Serbia and the Netherlands. And they really, they have a very large catalog in uh, overseas that they, of, of roses that they grow. And they really focus a lot on color, fragrance, and petal count. So we're going to see roses with a really high petal count uh, that, that smell absolutely amazing. <laughs> oh, these are so, just, I'm so excited about these. Now, are these ones that will not be in the garden centers this year? That exactly. They're available in 2023. You can find them online, but uh, I, we're really hoping that we're going to see a lot of them in garden centers in 2023 because it's just such a great classic garden rose, but that's also easy to grow. That's also been tested for disease resistance, you know, for this modern performance in this classic looking rose. Let's take just a moment, and um, while we do prefer to to buy from our garden centers, but Mm -hmm. if it's something new, tell our listeners how to find them online. You can find them online at provenwinners.com. So just go to provenwinners.com, go into their plant search, type in reminiscent, R-E-M-N-I-N. N-I-S-C-E-N-T, or you could just type in roses and it'll bring up all of our roses and you can buy them in different sizes online and they will ship them to you uh, when it's appropriate for your zone. And they are shipped from um, a local greenhouse here that just does a beautiful, beautiful job with their plants. So you're going to get a really, really healthy, well-developed shrub when you order them online through Proven Winners. And then after you grow yours, you can go to your garden center and tell them all about them. (laughs) Right. You could clip a rose and say, wouldn't you like to be growing this? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. So the first in the series that I'll talk about is Reminiscent Crema. Uh, This is just such a beautiful, I would call it a white rose, but it's not fully white. It's almost a buttermilk white color. So it's got that creamy white that, that tends toward the golden, uh, 
buttermilk color, yellowish golden centers, nice full rose, very fragrant. Uh, all of these roses in this series are still hardy all the way down to USDA zone four, heat tolerant is in zone nine. This is the smallest of the three. It's one and a half to three feet tall and two feet wide. So it's a great rose to put in a container. If you want to have a rose in a container, uh, let's say uh, you really want to grow a rose, but your beds are all shade beds. Put one in a container, mix it with things, and put it where there's sun on your patio or by your mm -hmm. front door. Imagine brushing by this beautiful scented rose every time you go in your door and getting that scent as you, you know, brush by it. So this is a great size for a container. Or for tucking into established garden beds, really. It's just a beautiful beautiful little rose it's so pretty and um and full but yet it would fit into all the little nooks and crannies where you need a little mm. pop of something that's right and white's always a great color in a garden right it really um tends to bring out all the colors around it i think i think having white in your garden palette is always a, a good choice and a and a kind of a breath of fresh air and this is a rich white. This is a deep, rich mm. white, you know, if that makes sense. But but it is, you know, it's very a very rich color with that a little bit uh, different shading in the middle, I think. Right, as opposed to your white that you'd get in a, in a daisy or, a, or mm -hmm. you know, or yes. something like that. Yes. It's got that creamy, creamy white color. So the second color in this reminiscent series, and there are going to be colors to come, but let's just talk about, let's Ooh. not get ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about 2023 right now, <laughs> but it's reminiscent coral. And this is a kind of a deep pink. It's, it, it really tends more toward the deep pink than the orange. And it's another full, it's got a very round bloom, whereas the crema has a very full kind of a loose bloom as it opens up. This is a around a little more tight toward the center uh so it's a it's a very beautiful deep pink color reminiscent coral uh it uh very fragrant i'll bring that up every time because it's so exciting for us and uh this is a little bit bigger two three and a half feet tall and two feet wide uh so it's uh got very upright branches so you're going to get your roses up high where you can see them, not just laying on the ground. And uh, it's a beautiful color in this series. And then the, finally, the third color we have is reminiscent pink. So where coral is kind of a, a deep pink with a little more tinge of, of the coral color toward the center of the rose, this is a full light pink rose with a yellow center. So this rose, once again, like the other three, high petal count, but it really opens up very wide and almost flat. So you can see those yellow stamens in the center and it has all these roughly little petals that surround it once it's wide, wide open. When I first uh, glanced at this one, I thought of Celsiana, the damask rose, very much mm -hmm. so. Even the little buds, it reminded yeah. me of the of Celsiana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, so it's just such a lovely pink. Uh, before it's, it, 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 I think the shape of this rose is beautiful at all stages. You're right. Yes. Bud to when it's partially open and just those those uh, petals are open mm -hmm. with the tight center. And then when it's just fully wide open, um, it's just a gorgeous uh, kind of almost curly, you know, in the center. Mm -hmm. It's hard to describe, but it's a beautiful yeah. rose, a very enchanting kind of mysterious scent. And uh, this is a nice size rose too, three to four feet tall and two feet wide. So it's a good sized rose. And that is the three. So those are the newest roses in our collection. And uh, we're, I'm just really excited about them. I'm just, you know. So happy to bring scent back. So happy to be able to introduce some of these old-fashioned looking garden roses. And, uh, you know, I hope people find them in the garden center really soon. Let's spend just a moment to talk about At Last because it should be available. And it is absolutely fantastic and, mm -hmm. and fairly new. So take, take a look, just a minute to talk about At Last. Sure. So I had mentioned earlier that At Last is part of our shrub rose collection. And when I say that, 
what I mean is it has it performs like all of our shrub roses perform. It has very disease-free or disease-resistant foliage. It's super easy to grow. But this has uh, a kind of like the reminiscent, a very classic rose bud. These roses, uh, these actual buds are smaller than the reminiscent rose buds, but it's their beautiful apricot color, Mm -hmm. a very, very... um, loose and free-flowing look to all of these roses and uh, they smell absolutely amazing and it and it really is a a a continuous blooming rose all of our shrub roses are self-cleaning so when they're done blooming they just drop their petals and keep blooming you don't have to prune them for to keep them blooming all summer i have an atlas rose in my garden I prune mine just because I like my roses to be super, super rounded. You know, mm-hmm, I, other too. people like the roses to have a very free flowing <clears throat> look, but I, I like to keep mine kind of tight and rounded. And what I love about roses is once you prune them, you could really predict when they're going to bloom again. Uh, they're you know, they're going to start setting buds and they're going to bloom again for you in just a few weeks. So if you had a, a special event coming or something like that, you can prune your shrub roses and you know, like in, in, you know, seven weeks, I'm going to have a whole new flat, you know, a whole new bunch of buds here that are going to open for my event. And this is just a beautiful, highly scented rose. I have a gorgeous picture. I wish that uh, your listeners could see the Shed Aquarium in Chicago planted a whole field of these Atlas roses in front of it. And uh, I like to say I prune mine, but Shed Aquarium doesn't. And it is absolutely (laughs) a field of orange roses of this apricot orange roses with the shed aquarium in the background and boy would i like to be standing up wind of that field uh it's got to just smell magnificent absolutely absolutely well friends i think we can safely say that fragrance is back in roses Mm -hmm. and uh oh i didn't mention it's about three feet tall and wide too so it's a really you know, convenient size to slip into a lot of garden spaces. It's a really good color in my garden. You know, I have peaches and lots and lots and lots of pink and it's a good blend color. It just kind of goes with everything in the garden. So I just really, really Mm -hmm. like it. It's a good size. It's yeah. I really, really like it. Well, that was certainly wonderful to hear about all the roses, but I'm equally excited to hear about some of these new companions for the roses. Sure. Uh, So a lot of people, uh, they want to know, you know, what makes a great companion plant? What could I put next to my roses that's, you know, going to kind of play nice with them? And I like to say that plants like people are best paired with partners that bring out their best qualities and share their space equally. So it doesn't overwhelm it or, and it doesn't underwhelm. It doesn't disappear next to your roses. (laughs) And uh, there's a, there's, so many ways that we can make that happen. We can choose, you know, texture and color that is different than your roses so that it contrasts with the roses. Or we can choose uh, colors and sizes and bud shapes that are similar to the roses. So they echo the beautiful look of your roses, maybe in another color and in a different growing pattern. The other thing we want to think about when we're choosing companion plants are ones that might extend your season. Plants that um, maybe bloom before your roses or bloom after your roses or that have great fall color so that we have color throughout your season. When your roses are done blooming in the end of the summer, you might have some shrubs situated in there that have a, a really great fall color story that continue to make your, you know, your gardens sing throughout the season. And of course, we want to choose shrubs that have similar cultural requirements. We want to choose full sun. We want to choose what shrubs that like well-drained soil and that have similar water needs. So that's what we're going to look at today and keep in consideration today when we talk about some great choices for companion plants. So my first choice, and it's a really beloved plant for me is potentilla. And it's funny because some people will say potentilla, don't we see that like planted by gas stations and things like that? (laughs) Well, yeah, you might because they're so (laughs) darn easy to grow. Like you can't go wrong with these. They're native. 
So they're, they're going to, you know, they're going to be happy in almost any soil you put them in. They're super, super uh, tolerant of most zones, USDA down to USDA zone two and up to zone seven. So I can't grow them in Alabama, but I can grow them in Michigan and I can grow them pretty far south. Um, and they're a, and they're a nice compact size. We have a happy face series of potentilla that only grows to two to three feet tall and wide. They're happy in full depart sun, just like roses. And they have that flower shape that echoes a single rose shape. So we talked about something that echoes that rose shape um, with that broad, open, five-petal flower. Uh, the Happy Face series comes in three colors. You can get the white-flowered one, yellow, or we have two kinds of pink potentillas. And uh, the, they'll start flowering early in the season, and they will flower without you having to do a ding-dang thing to them all season long top to bottom they'll be covered in happy bright blooms and uh, they'll really complement your roses they have this delicate gray green foliage that's very different from your rose foliage and um, it's just a great companion plant for a lot of plants but i think especially for roses because it echoes that beautiful uh rose bloom i would totally agree i have several Oh, good. Yeah. I love potentillas. They just make me happy. And that's why I think the ha- the name Happy Face is so fitting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, another thing I like to pair with roses are plants that are blue. Because, you know, we talked about uh, Rise Up Lilac Days and it has that blue lavender flower. But we don't get a lot of blue when we talk about roses. And blue in the garden is such a beautiful color. And it's really easy to add uh, when you think about things like nepeta, uh, catmint, and uh, English lavender. And the nice thing about uh, nepeta and English lavender is they have that tall, spiky look. So it gives us a very different form and texture than of your roses. So it, it complements them by being, being really wholly different, um, but complements them in color and form. The, the, the foliage, once again, is that gray green color and i'm going to talk about foliage a little bit when we talk about plants that are great companions because foliage can really carry a lot of the color story load in your garden whereas roses you know the thing we we want healthy foliage on roses but we're all about the flowers right so let's add the companions that's that create a color story with foliage like this lavender, like catmint with that beautiful blue Mm -hmm. color that continues all the way into that gray blue foliage. They're hardy. Um, Hidcoat lavender is a nice hardy variety, USDA zone five to nine and brings that beautiful scent into the garden. And I don't know if you've ever grown catmint in your garden. They're a pollinator magnet. So if you want to bring more bees into your roses and into your garden, catmint is a great choice. And they're beautiful flush after flush. You know, they bloom, cut them back, they'll bloom again, cut them back, bloom again. Mm. Yeah, I mean, catmint is just, uh, cat's pajamas only gets 12 to 18 inches tall and wide. So it's a nice smaller size too, to kind of situate, you know, near the base of your, of your roses. All right. And another, now I mentioned briefly, let's talk about foliage and uh, how can we create a beautiful color storage just with foliage, not even worrying about other flowering plants that we're going to put beside our roses. And uh, one way I like to do that is with variegated foliage, foliage that brings in the green with the yellow borders and uh, stone crop or sedum is a great way to do that. Uh, rock and low boogie woogie stone crop is just, it's 16 to 18 inches tall and wide. It does have a, a yellow spring flower, but it, the foliage on the stone crop sedum is uh, dark green in the center with that yellow creamy border. Mm-hmm. It's, it brings that beautiful light variegation in. This, you know, that yellow color in that sedum almost can help Uh, accentuate the yellow centers of your roses, the yellow stamens Mm -hmm. that show in the center of your roses. And it kind of just 
hugs around the bottom of the plants. And the thing I really love about sedum as well is once you get it established, you it doesn't need any extra water. It just grows happily in, uh, among your roses and looks absolutely beautiful all season long. I love sedums I too. I just think they're oh, they're workhorses in the garden. I just love they them. They are. They are, and they just bring such a a unique interest point to any garden, I think, especially a full sun garden. Mm -hmm. And uh, then another great variegated plant that I love is golden variegated sage. Uh, and uh, the one, uh, it, they get about two to three feet tall and wide. So you can kind of situate them between your plants or near your plants. Um, you, uh, they, they really can have a woody structure but I, you know, you can prune them down early in the season to give them a better shape. But I love golden variegated sage. Once again, it's got that green center and then the light green margin, irregular margin around the outside. It's edible. Um, USDA zone six to nine. So it, it needs a little bit of a warmer climate. You could also plant it and treat it like an annual. If it, you know, if you're in a really cold zone, put it in your garden and treat it like an annual. I do that all the time. There's nothing like planting an, an ornamental oregano or sage or something like that. And, and, you know, bringing yet another scent into your garden. When you brush by one of those, uh, or pluck a, a leaf off, it just brings another beautiful scent into your garden. So it appeals to all the senses, scent and visual and size and shape and color. Uh, and that's why I love bringing in um, ornamental and practical uh, herbs into the garden. Absolutely. Just perfect companions, I think. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, another uh, plant that I'd like to talk about are a, a really a wide variety of plants are plants that have that dark purple or some people call it black foliage, but it's really a dark purple foliage. And uh, we have a plant called spilled wine, Wygilla. We also have Kodiak black. We have a lot of plants. If you go to um, the proven winners YouTube page, you'll find a top 10 plants with black foliage uh, video. And bringing that dark purple or black foliage is another way to add interest to a garden. So something like a spilled wine wygilla, it's going to bloom for you early in the season with those hot pink blooms, bringing that, extending that season, bringing color into your garden early before your roses bloom. And then it's going to provide a beautiful backdrop to your roses with that deep purple saturated foliage uh, that, uh, you know, really, once again, helps support that, that color story throughout the season. <clears throat> and then do you have time for one more? I do. I do. Okay. When we're talking about bringing foliage color into your garden as companion plants to your roses, one of my favorite foliage colors is chartreuse, that light green colored foliage. And there's a lot of ways you can bring chartreuse foliage into your garden. Uh, Chesky gold dwarf birch has a beautiful uh, light green uh, leaf. Winecraft gold smoke bush. If you have, you want to do something kind of a statement piece toward the back of your garden with your roses in front, has that beautiful light green leaf. Jutsia has light green leaves. Golden ticket privet um, is a non-invasive privet that could also be a great, uh, if you're layering your garden, to put in behind your roses because it's going to get fairly tall. But uh, it has another light chartreuse colored leaf. Um, but one thing I really love is spirea. And I know spirea is another one of those garden workhorses, right? That yes. people plant a lot of times, like you'll see them in front of office buildings because they're so darn easy to grow. But they also have such a great color seat story. They start out, you know, the foliage and a typical spirea, uh, let's just talk about double play Big Bang, will start out orange with red tips. So you'll get this early spring flush of foliage that's this bright orange with red tips. It'll transition into the summer and turn this light chartreuse green color. And that's when the lavender flowers start popping all over the outside of the shrub. So you get this, you know, you not only get the color, uh, 
early in the season, but it changes as your season goes on. And that's one thing I love about Spirea. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have a lot of, a a lot of members of the double play series of Spirea and proven winners color choice double play bing bang. I just love because it has that yellow summer foliage. It only gets to be two to three feet tall and wide. And um, once it flowers with its lavender flowers, you can trim it. So just give it a nice shaping kind of a trim and it'll reflush with flowers, you know, and you can do that a a few times in the season, really. And it'll just flush with new flowers. It's hardy in USDA zone three to eight. So it's a really great companion plant offering that different color. Now, if you are just like, I don't want a spirea that I have to trim all the time to get to rebloom. Well, we've got you covered there, too, because we have another spirea called Double Play Doozy. Now, it's not going to bring you that light uh, yellow summer foliage, but it will start out bright red. Its spring foliage is like candy apple red, and then it'll transition to a dark green foliage with red tips with a deep red flower. So the flower on Double Play Doozy will really um, complement if you have any other red roses nearby or yellow roses nearby. It will look beautiful with it. And this is a a seedless variety, so you don't have to trim it to get it to rebloom. Um, a lot of times to get these to rebloom, you need to shear all those old seed heads off. This one will just bloom straight through where the old bloom was because there are no seeds to tell it to stop blooming. You know, usually they're like, I said seed, I'm done blooming. <laughs> well, <laughs> this one doesn't have any seeds and it'll just keep blooming for you all season long. And then it'll finish out a beautiful orange color in the fall. Oh, that just sounds perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I talked about a lot of shrubs. I, uh, you know, I work for a shrub company. I love shrubs because they're just so low maintenance, you know, and they're easy to grow. A rose, you know, is essentially a shrub. It's a woody ornamental and um, they just, they place so nicely together. (laughs) Oh, they do. Natalie, this has been so wonderful. We've heard about so many good things and we, we can actually see them by going to provenwinners.com. So we can actually see Mm -hmm. what you've talked about. And then there's a YouTube channel, which is wonderful. So Mm -hmm. there are ways for, for our listeners to see all the beautiful things. So thanks so much. This thing so much for joining me. It's just been wonderful. And I simply can't wait to get to the garden center. Yeah. And I do want to bring up too, there's another website you can go to and it's mypwcolorchoices.com. M-O-I-P-W colorchoices.com. And there's a, and there is a retailer locator on that site. So if you're looking for a local retailer, you can go on there and see who's local in your area that is selling our plants. Oh, that's so helpful. Thanks. That is so helpful. You bet. Well, thanks for all that you do and all the hard work. I, this has just been wonderful today. We're so ready. We're, you know, we're going to roll up our sleeves and, you know, we've got things to choose from. We're going to go get them and get them planted. That sounds perfect. <laughs> yes. Friends, I hope you heard about some plants today that will fit perfectly into your garden plan. And until next time, happy gardening. You've been listening to the Rose Chat Podcast with Chris Van Cleve and Teresa Byington, expert rose gardeners who want to help you achieve the rose garden of your dreams. Don't miss an episode. Listen anytime on our website at rosechatpodcast.com or listen on the go via the Rose Chat app on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Share this podcast with your social networks and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by using the hashtag Rose Chat. Join us next time for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. The Rose Chat Podcast is a production of the Rose Chat Media Group, Birmingham, Alabama.